Hello and welcome. Welcome to today's uh, Council on Foreign Relations meeting marking the launch of the Task Force Report on Non-Communicable Diseases. <coughs> Uh, this meeting, um, unlike many at the Council, um, is on the record. Um, and joining me to discuss the report, uh, we are fortunate to have its co-chairs, Mitch Daniels and Tom Donilon, uh, and uh, the uh, project's director, Tom Boyke, all of whom you know well. Um, <clears throat> Mitch Daniels has a long career in public service, serving as Indiana's governor for two terms, starting in 2004, and is currently the president of Purdue University, Tom Donilon, also a long storied career in public service, uh, which culminated with his years as President Barack Obama's national security advisor. And Tom Boyke is the Council's Senior Fellow for Global Health, Economics, and Development, and formerly worked at the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative uh, and at the Department of Health and Human Services. We'll start, as always, with uh, a conversation with the speakers um, and then move to your questions. Um, the usual uh, reminders, please turn off your cell phones. Um, <clears throat> one of the Council's great strengths uh, is that in addition to weighing in with expert voices on the most high-profile uh, international issues of the day, it also looks to shed light on undercovered, uh, surprising, um, important um, uh, issues uh, for U.S. foreign policy. Uh, and that's uh, this task force uh, report is a very good example of that. The report says in its opening lines, the biggest global health crisis in low and middle income countries is not the one you might think. It is cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and other non-communicable diseases, NCDs, which killed more than 8 million people before their 60th birthdays in low and middle income countries in 2013 alone. <clears throat> the other thing to note about this report um, is that uh, it is very practical minded. It is uh, specific about recommendations and very clear <clears throat> about uh, uh, common sense and cost-efficient ways to address uh, what is a, a sort of unrecognized uh, national security issue and foreign policy issue for the U.S. So without further ado, um, uh, to elaborate on that point, um, Tom, let's start. Why is the Council interested in non-communicable diseases like cardiovascular disease and uh, diabetes in the developing world. Thank you, Mastelon. It's great to, great to be here today, and we've had a, really had a terrific task force, I think. And, um, and Mitch will talk a little bit about some of the, uh, uh, you know, some of the discussions that we had leading to these, leading to these conclusions, but I, but I will tell you that the, that the initial discussions we had as a task force were around that very issue. Uh, what, is the, what is the U.S. interest here? What is the U.S. strategic and security interest uh, in a global, in a, in, a, in a health issue. And this is the first, I think the first task force on global health that the Council on Foreign Relations has ever done. Uh, and, it's, and, and the answer w that we came to, which I is, think which is, is worth remarking on, it's the first yeah. report on a global health issue that the Council has ever right. done. Right, yeah. Uh, and it, uh, let's start with the scale of the issue. Uh, uh, it, is, it is the principal health threat uh, to uh, low and moderate income countries in the world. Uh, it's a threat because of its nature that will only grow uh, and become more difficult and it become exacerbated. The scale is really tr tremendous. I mean, we, the w, uh, World Economic Forum estimates and has stated that in its judgment, uh, next to climate change, this is the principal threat to world economic development. Uh, they also estimate, they put a, a number on it, uh, which is cited in our report, uh, which is they estimate that by 2030, the losses due to NCDs uh, could approach 21 or $22 trillion. Uh, which is the total output of these countries, I think, last year in, 20, uh, in 20, uh, 2013. Uh, this obviously leads to a, a number of concerns of the United States. The United States also is the, is the long time and existing global leader in health uh, in the world. Uh, but from a strategic perspective, from the perspective that I would look at it from my former perch as National Security Advisor, it has an you know, absolutely clear impact uh, going forward on the long-term economic stability of these countries, on their stability generally, on their governments, on their militaries. Uh, it also, uh, because of its nature, uh, has the uh, real the prospect of undercutting a lot of our existing programs and development and health programs. Uh, we have invested a lot over the last decade uh, in communicable diseases focused on HIV AIDS and made tremendous progress and made a tremendous contribution to the world. The very same populations who are saved through those efforts are at risk through this threat. Uh, and it makes no really very little sense in our assessment uh, uh, to have you undermined uh, the very efforts that we have uh, that we have uh, we have underway, um, 
And also, and I'll finish on, on, on another point before we, we, we can go into this in, in great detail with respect to kind of its long-term, the long-term threat here and the long-term interest the United States has in not seeing it become the kind of threat that it could become. It also is a really important opportunity for collaboration uh, between the United States and some other major countries in the world, especially countries like China uh, and Brazil, mm -hmm. where we are really looking for ways to collaborate on addressing, on addressing global and, and transnational issues. So for all those reasons, our task force came to the conclusion that in fact it was uh, a very important issue for the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, I certainly, we had another national security advisor on our, former national security advisor on our team uh, on the task force, Sandy Berger, uh, came to the conclusion and, and, and indicated to the, to the task force our judgment that if we were still a national security advisor, we would clearly see this as a national security threat and one that should be addressed in the interest of the United States. Well, another thing that in speaking with you uh, all about uh, the, the task force prior to the report as task force, it, it became clear that this was not um, what in Washington sometimes happens, which is a group of people are named and, they're, um, and the next thing they hear or see is a report lands on their desk and they read it quickly and sign <coughs> off on it. This was clearly uh, something of a discussion from the start and I think it adds to uh, the understanding of the final product if we talk a little bit about, um, about that. So, Governor Daniels, tell, tell us a little bit about where you came in on this project and how the conversation developed. All that's true to say the least. As Tom said, we came to the conclusion. We didn't start with a conclusion. Quite the contrary. Um, I think this report, this, this was my first opportunity to take part in a CFR project, but I've been a part of many uh, similar ones. And this one, by the time it was over, uh, I thought was distinctive uh, for uh, a second set of reasons that your question uh, surfaces. I mean, first it was distinctive because the first time, the, as you mentioned, that the councils even looked uh, at the issue of health, uh, global health. But um, uh, to, to me, uh, this report strengthened as it went along through the work of our, of our colleagues who did, many of them, I confess to having been one at the outset, start somewhat skeptically is this as big a deal as is being suggested? Uh, if it, even if it is, does it really engage the United States national interest to a, the extent that warrants the work we're going to do? Um, we did ultimately conclude, as Tom just pointed out, the answer to those questions was emphatically in the affirmative. Um, but then uh, I think the thing that I, I want to pay tribute to our colleagues about is that um, at least in contrast with many that I've been part of or read, uh, this is a very data-driven report. That was insisted on by many of our colleagues. You'll find more factual content than in many uh, such reports. It also, um, I would contend, um, is uh, far more specific and actionable and realistic in its suggestions. It did not fall prey to the common tendency to let every cook throw his or her preferred vegetable in the stew until in the end what you have is something that says everything and says, so, therefore says very little. And uh, the, uh, the immediate short-term suggestions that are made are highly uh, practical and affordable, um, not unimportant in this situation. Lastly, it I think speaks candidly to the question of resource prioritization. One thing governments aren't very good at is is rotating resources in a nimble way as circumstances evolve. And uh, while we don't prescribe any level of this or that, we do point out the uh, rather stunning opportunity that's here in a situation in which the U.S., which is only spending two-tenths of a percent of its budget on the whole global health picture, is only spending a little over a tenth of a percent of that on NCDs. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, there's, between an actionable set of uh, options mm -hmm. and uh, the fact that we're starting from essentially zero, a real difference could be made, a detectable difference could be made in a reasonably uh, short period of time if this, these ideas were taken seriously. Okay, so um, I'm sure that we will have from the audience very uh, uh, probing and, and hard uh, questions. Let me start off with, with one or two of my own. Um, isn't this a high class, first world problem, heart disease, uh, smoking? Um, why, uh, why are we making other people's health choices our 
budgetary priority. Great. Um, well, first, uh, before I answer that, I want to thank the co-chairs for their service on this task force. They really did a remarkable job. This is uh, not an easy issue um, in, uh, in general. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's not one uh, with which, for instance, um, many of the task force members might have been familiar with beforehand. So they did a really fantastic job shepherding this uh, through the process, and I want to acknowledge that. I also want to acknowledge we have some task force members here in the audience, uh, Secretary Glickman, um, Binta Brown, and uh, Jean-Paul Cartien. I want to thank them also uh, for their involvement uh, in this process. The last bit of thanks, and then I'll move on to your, your great question, is uh, this report is really data-driven. It's um, many, many of our task force reports uh, may not necessarily in include footnotes. This has really uh, 30 figures. It's, it's been very um, uh, both what the problem looks like, how these diseases present themselves in developing countries, and what the solutions uh, were. We did this all through data, and we did that for the reasons that the chairs identified, which was that um, people needed to be convinced that this was a problem and that there were solutions out there. And on the data front, I want to acknowledge Chris Murray and uh, his uh, colleagues, um, Joe Dealman and Tara Templin, who uh, worked with us through the Global Burden of Disease Report, which provided a lot, if not most, of the data. And they really did a fantastic job, so I want to acknowledge that. <coughs> to your great question, is this, is this an issue of uh, the world uh, succumbing to couch potato syndrome and smoking at home, uh, drinking, uh, moving to more unhealthy lifestyles, uh, making use of the increasing incomes uh, in these settings and the fact that we, we've made some progress on infectious diseases. And what you can find in the report is uh, a very uh, clear case made that absolutely the fact that people <coughs> aren't dying in childhood of, and adolescence of the plagues and parasites that they used to has something to do with the rise of NCDs, but only partially. What that doesn't explain is why people are getting them so much faster so much younger and with such worse outcomes than they did in high-income countries. Uh, that's the first part. Uh, the second is that you might be surprised. The higher rates of uh, cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease are actually in lower-income populations, just as they are here in the United States. Um, and there's pretty strong evidence in the report on that in low-middle-income countries. And the last point I would make is that uh, while certainly obesity is rising in these countries, it's still incredibly low. Um, you're talking about adult obesity rates of 5% in low-income countries, maybe 7% in lower-middle-income countries. In the US, it's over a third. Uh, many, many more multiples. So these countries' problems aren't uh, necessarily the same that we, we have here, and that's part of the reason why we did a, uh, we look specifically at low and middle income countries instead of tackling the problems of NCDs globally. Because what's happening in these countries is, is different. But if it's partly couch potato syndrome um, and they're getting wealthier, what, what are the other drivers? So it, it's partly that they're living longer. I'm not sure how much of the, uh, the couch uh, potato syndrome they, uh, they have, but they, it's... They can, um, they can get ill from cancer or cardiovascular disease because they're living long enough to uh, yeah. enter the age range where those diseases tend to strike. Right. And mortality remains elusive. We, we all must die of something. Um, it, it's... Uh, As a smoking friend of mine used to say, you'll die healthier than I will. Yeah. So. Uh, but it matters when, and what's surprising about these, uh, these diseases in these countries is how many people 59 and younger are getting them. We looked at the burden in the 49 countries that the U.S. invests $5 million or more in, and NCDs represent the largest source of premature death and disability in those countries, and not much of our current investment. Uh, what's driving these things? Persistent poverty. Uh, Urbanization. Urbanization to some degree. These countries are investing, improving their healthcare systems, but their spending is still really low. Uh, health spending in low and middle income countries tripled over the last 20 years, but all of the governments of Sub Saharan Africa spend as much as the government of Poland 
on uh, their health care. If you add all low and middle income countries together, which represent 5.7 billion people, they spend as much as the United Kingdom, as Germany and France and Canada combined, representing 250 million people. It gives you a <laughs> sense of the disparities involved. So increase in risk factors from urbanization, uh, the fact that these countries don't have established health systems, uh, make it more likely that they'll develop a non-communicable disease like cancer, cardiovascular disease younger, and the fact that there isn't the availability of uh, chronic care and that the people remain still um, uh, too poor to purchase these services out of pocket means they're more likely to become disabled or die as a result. Just, just to follow that a little bit, there's no question, uh, it seems to me, that a 23-year increase in global life expectancy over six decades uh, plays a significant role, but it is so far from the complete explanation that some might have, have speculated, and, and Tom just gave you most of the reasons why. I mean, I think what struck me was that, that um, it, it is striking uh, so heavily at the middle age, middle class, where there is a, a reasonable middle class, um, classes of these societies uh, on whom they largely will depend if they're going to uh, rise and surmount the problems he just talked about. And again, I'd like to go back to the fact we can't, I don't think, the report doesn't pretend that the U.S. or even a consortium of countries can build a, uh, a health infra, public health infrastructures and things where there aren't any. But antihypertensives are available at, at little, literally pennies right. per day. Um, vaccines, a hepatitis B vaccine that would present, prevent liver cancer in large uh, uh, numbers, uh, likewise inexpensive, likewise the uh, uh, vaccine uh, for cervical cancer. And that's exactly why the panel members pushed the staff to search the data for those sort of interventions. Right. And you could make a real difference e decades before these macro conditions come around. So let's, let's break that down a little bit because it's a good, a good thing to follow up on. The, the, the report does break into three different categories uh, the uh, remedies and the actions that the U.S. can take, um, uh, immediate and high impact, uh, soon and high impact, and long-term collaborative. Um, what exactly are you recommending that the U.S. Uh, uh, do, and, and how did you break it into those uh, three categories? Do you want to? So we, um, we, we put them in three categories. There are the interventions that are largely shovel-ready. Um, in the same way that uh, uh, with the ramp up of the uh, response to HIV AIDS, they looked at the, the things that could immediately be put out at that time, which are antiretrovirals. Um, uh, we're looking at this crisis in the same way. What can be done now? And one of the things you realize when you, when you look at the, uh, uh, at the data is that the, despite much higher rates of obesity, and unhealthier habits, we've had dramatic declines in premature mortality in the US and in other high-income countries. A lot of that is driven by really cheap interventions. So just to rattle a few in this first category, uh, hypertension control, primary and uh, secondary prevention of uh, heart attacks, most importantly, tobacco control, um, which is, is not only cheap, but revenue generating. Um, vaccinations for cervical cancer and liver cancer, which do not have um, the di distribution that they need to. So that's the first category. The second category are things that exist that we put in good, um, uh, put to good use in this country, particularly a lot of cancers. We've done a very nice job of reducing premature uh, mortality from them, whether it's breast cancer or leukemia, stomach cancer. Uh, some of the interventions for this need, need adaptation. It's still really expensive to do mammography and resource intensive to do um, uh, that type of diagnostic work in a lot of low and middle income countries. Radiation services are not uh, necessarily available. We need to do a better job of adapting these existing tools for use in low resource setting. And the last thing, and we were, the committee was very um, adamant about making sure we covered this, is the US certainly doesn't have all the answers. Um, to non-commutable diseases. We do have an enormous obesity problem. Um, as uh, Secretary Glickman kept us honest uh, throughout this process, we have lots of nutrition issues in this country. 
Uh, there's a range of problems that we have that we don't know the answer to, these countries may not know the answer to, and uh, the possibility of working together to develop those uh, is, is something we should do. That's the Let third basket. Let me follow up on a couple. I think that the, you know, in the first instance, of course, it, it, the, the task force calls on the United States to have a focused strategy mm -hmm. and effort here, which it doesn't have right now. Uh, we, 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 we have not as a government, with respect to our international development and, and specifically our health efforts here, focused on this problem. And one of the important things I think the report does, particularly through the data that's presented, right, uh, and the exploration of the data and implications that's presented, is to, call, is, to, is to provide the basis for such a focused program by the United States, first, uh, first and foremost. Second, it calls upon the United States to look at the allocation of resources that Governor Daniels was, was, was talking about. Uh, uh, here, we, we, we allocate very little, uh, and the conclusion of the report is that given the proven approaches that we have to specific problems, that a modest uh, increase or appropriation allocation of resources can have a very significant impact. Uh, third, uh, it is different uh, in the lower moderate income countries today in 2014 with respect to these outcomes than it has been for the developed countries. Uh, it's different, different tracks, different circumstances, different infrastructures, and they're getting far worse outcomes that can be affected, the next point is, by specific interventions mm -hmm. that, are laid, that are laid out here. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really something that we spent a lot of time on, which is basically, all right, what, what can we affect, right? And, and, the, and the three that Tom went through with respect to low-cost drugs and the, that are off patent right now for hypertension, yeah. uh, the kinds of vaccination that we can undertake, you know, one of the, the, the uh, cervical cancer the situation in Sub-Saharan Sub Africa really is, it, uh, can be dramatically affected through interventions that we know work, uh, and intervention now in tobacco uh, can, have a, uh, can have a significant impact. And the last point I would make is, and it's, it's later in the report with respect to what to do, is also do it now. Yeah. This problem is going to get worse, uh, and there are some places, and tobacco is an example we can talk about, where an intervention now would make a tremendous difference. T uh, tobacco use in Africa, for example, right now is at a fairly low level. Uh, it's going to rise and it's going to have tremendously bad in impact. And an intervention now can have a tremendous effect. So those are the kinds of discussions that we, that we had. And the last thing I want to un underscore something that, that Mitch said, which is that, um, you know, uh, I've been involved in a lot of task force reports at the Council on Foreign Relations over the years. Um, and, um, you know, national security officials uh, have views. <laughs> To get represented in, uh, uh, in, in various reports. Here we really did you, I think, to the, to the Daniel Patrick Moynihan admonition that, uh, that everybody's entitled to their own opinions but not their own facts. Uh, and uh, that really was an important part, I think, of the dynamic here uh, that we wanted to really, it was kind of a, a, kind of a show me exercise here. Uh, to, that led us to these conclusions. Well, I think your comments have, have, uh, have, have shown the specificity both of the findings and uh, of the responses. And um, I think um, without further ado, we can um, then start taking some uh, questions uh, from the assembled audience. Um, a couple of quick reminders for the uh, Q&A session. Um, please wait for the microphone um, and uh, speak directly into it. Um, stand. Uh, state your name and your affiliation, please. Um, and uh, please, as always, keep your questions concise and to the form of a question. Um, why don't we start here uh, with the uh, gentleman with the beard at the center table, right behind you. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, this is a terrific report coming at a very important time. My name is Jeff Muir. I'm with the Public Health Institute, and I'm the co-chair of an organization called the NCD Roundtable, which exists to build awareness and to help create new resources for the US government response to NCDs. We would welcome any folks here uh, joining our group and our effort. But in terms of the report, uh, the one thing that, I, uh, that comes to mind, and uh, this is not gonna be a surprise to those who follow NCDs regularly, is that um, we've had difficulty getting traction, to say the least, with our interlocutors on the Hill uh, specifically. And I'm wondering if the, the, the uh, gentlemen represented on the panel here today have any advice for those of us in the advocacy world about how we can leverage this terrific 
groundbreaking report into uh, awareness and action on Capitol Hill. Thanks very much. Can you fix Congress? <laughs> <laughs> well done, I wish. <laughs> um, what well, two quick thoughts. One, and this may not prove useful, but it's, it's an, I think, an important statement in the report, and one day it needs to be, uh, we need to find a way to make it effective, and that is we talk about uh, uh, trying to shift attention as these decisions are made from disease-based to outcome-based criteria. And um, we all know that the, the uh, why and how human and natural it is that a lot of th such these decisions do get driven on a disease-specific basis. There's emotion around it and passion, and of course. Uh, some, and, but uh, what, the, what these data shout is that if you think about outcomes, it will pull you inexorably and quickly in the direction uh, that your organization and our recommendations talk about. I mean, um, you'll come across this stunning factoid in the report that using the conventional measure, uh, disability adjusted life years, um, $44 for AIDS, $4 for malaria, two cents for all NCDs put together. And um, so when the, if the conversation can be moved somehow further in the direction of outcomes, then I think the kind of actions that are suggested here and that you're probably advocating become pretty hard to argue with. The appropriations process. Um, uh, the lady with the glasses right there, yep. No longer. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, thank you. Um, Stephanie Burgos with Oxfam. Um, thank you very much for a fascinating report, which I haven't yet had a chance to read. But from the presentation, my question um, goes to in terms of what, uh, what the US can do, and in particularly shovel-ready um, issues. Um, I noted the focus on, um, on tobacco prevention, yet um, uh, we see I, what I would call policy incoherence in terms of U.S. And through our trade agreements actually pushing um, liberalization of, um, of for uh, sending, selling cigarettes overseas, um, for prohibiting um, uh, labeling, et cetera. So there are a lot of um, things I think that, that could be done. We see um, the pressure on India and other developing countries um, to to um, um, change their intellectual property regimes so that they don't use public health flexibilities to um, make uh, medicines available at a cheaper price. So are there things, did, did the task force look at those types of things that, that could be done uh, that to utilize without spending more money, um, but to utilize um, existing policy um, measures by making U.S. policy more coherent in some of those ways, or even using the federal funds that go to research and development now to make medicines more available in the developing world. Thank you. Interagency, Tom. Yeah. Well, uh, but on that, why don't we have Tom, who, who uh, sure. is the expert in the in the in the, uh, in the specific trade area? Okay. Sure. Yeah, that's right. um, yeah. Uh, I'm, for those of you who haven't read the report, when you do, you'll see the task force uh, actually directly took on the issue of tobacco and trade. Uh, there is a recommendation in the report uh, that uh, the U.S. in um, uh, trade negotiations moving forward should negotiate a exception that encompasses the full range of tobacco control laws, uh, both domestically and under international law, specifically the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Uh, so the, the report uh, did make that um, uh, recommendation, and it was unanimous, uh, which is remarkable given uh, multiple trade officials on uh, the task force and bipartisan. Uh, in terms of uh, medicines, um, there is a real problem around availability uh, in these countries. Uh, for when you look at it at a population level, the vast majority of it, though, however, is drugs that are off patent. They're statins, they're uh, um, uh, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, the kinds of things. I mean, 
Insulin has existed since the 1920s, but isn't necessarily as widely available or as affordable as it should be in a lot of these countries. It's a whole range of interventions like that. So in terms of what we really recommended, what can be done now, shovel ready, uh, these long existing, very cheap interventions, if you're, if you're going to invest somewhere, seem like a, a better route to go. And it is a, uh, it is a, it is a, a classic interagency problem in the United States government. Uh, it's not the province of any single agency in the, in, in the U.S. government. Uh, in, in my judgment and experience, I think it can only be, uh, it can only be run um, through kind of a declaration from the President and the White House that this is an important development and global and health priority, uh, and to charge the National Security Advisor and the National Security Council to put together a coherent strategy and implement it. Uh, there's really no other way in our government to get something done across, across the agency except through that, except through that mechanism. No single agency can take it on. Uh, and do it effectively. And in this case, if I were designing it, it would, it, you would design an interagency process that would pull together the trade officials, health officials, AID, State Department, and uh, infuse a strategy into money allocation, bilateral relationships, activities at international institutions, uh, perhaps some new initiatives. Uh, I think particularly, that there's a lot, I mentioned it very briefly at the beginning, there's a lot here potentially in terms of um, bilateral cooperation with some large countries around the world who have a big interest in this, like the Chinese. Um, so uh, I hesitate to put you on the spot, Tom, but just so we don't pass by that too quickly, that sounds like a recommendation from Barack Obama's former national security advisor to his former boss to adopt a policy. That's, the, uh, that's one of the thrusts of the report. Okay. Uh, and that's, that's the work that, uh, that the task force did, uh, again, starting out from a as Governor Daniels said, starting out from a position of asking ourselves, asking ourselves some hard fundamental questions about whether this should be that kind of issue, uh, whether it should be the kind of issue that would be a, a priority for our development assistance and our health issues, health efforts, and uh, with uh, some skepticism at the beginning, with a lot of hard work looking at the, at the facts, came to the conclusion that in fact we would make that kind of recommendation to the U.S. government. Perfect. Who else? Let's see. Um, in the further in the back there. Yes. No, that's you <clears throat> with the yellow tie. Yep. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Patrick Kelly, and at the Institute of Medicine, I direct the board on global health. Um, you know, chronic diseases are uh, very different from acute diseases, and demand a lot of the health system. Uh, I'm wondering, in addition to the uh, the types of interventions that you've alluded to, whether the task force uh, addressed any time to looking at the need for strong underlying health systems to be the platform or the delivery system to deliver these interventions. If you only have the tools but not the underlying system, uh, it's hard to achieve the ultimate goals. I wondered if you had any insights relating to health systems versus uh, some of the specific technical interventions. It's also been a big uh, mm -hmm. issue for some of the larger NGOs, Gates Foundation, and so forth. Anybody want to? Well, Tom will remember and, and say more, but <clears throat> yes, we had long discussions about that. Again, um, you'll find under the, the short-term category, we were looking really at preventive measures, recognizing the systems aren't ready for long-term palliative or treatment in many cases. And I do remember, and I, the report speaks to the fact, however, that there are possibilities to build on the platform of, uh, of uh, those successful global health initiatives that have already gone on. And we ought to, uh, in terms of infrastructure building, we ought to look to those opportunities to bolt on or, or, or extend uh, the, uh, those uh, systems which have been put in place to, to fight AIDS, for instance. And, yeah. um. Uh, I, I agree with that, and I agree with the point you made about health systems. Uh, there's no question in high-income countries and low-income countries alike, the long-term solution to premature uh, death and disability from NCDs is functional health systems. It's, uh, it's better urban design. It's uh, more sensible agricultural policies. You can really uh, go across uh, the gamut. What's unusual about low- and middle-income countries is we're asking them, or they're being forced to do that, on a much shorter time frame than we have uh, with far fewer resources. And given that, uh, I think one of the th reasons why it's been hard to make progress on NCDs personally is that the answer can't be to start with a whole of governments 
solution to this problem. There need to be specific things that you can do to start addressing these countries' needs now and afford them the time to be able to respond to the longer-term concerns that this emerging epidemic raises. And that's what we focused on in the report. But we acknowledge that any long-term, <coughs> as you put it, Patrick, the ultimate goal in this solution can only be reached through having functional uh, health systems. The question is, um, what we wanted to put in this report is that you don't have to wait for that to occur. There's lots that can be done now. Yes, Anya. Thank you. Anya Shmemen, American University. The current um, communicable global health crisis uh, is Ebola, which has thrown a spotlight on the lack of infrastructure and the need for uh, health reform in the affected countries. Um, it's also highlighted the role of the international community. I wonder what other lessons you can draw from the Ebola crisis that, um, that can be applied to NCDs. Who wants to? Tackle the well. I'll say a couple of things. I'm not, not an expert in this area, but a couple of things. One is um, um, this effort's not in competition, obviously, with an effort to deal with the Ebola crisis. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's the first point. That's a, it's a crisis, and that uh, the administration, uh, the United States, is seeking additional resources for, uh, and is working in the international community to, to address and needs to. Number one, um, that doesn't take away from the fact that this NCD um, threat is the most significant long-term threat to low and moderate income uh, countries. And third, I guess my observation would be that a number of the uh, challenges that you have with respect to Ebola, as you, as, you, as you set forth, exist with respect to NCDs. Uh, and they are these infrastructure, uh, these are these infrastructure issues. You know, in, in response to the prior question, you know, we really did, we focused on that, but we also focused here on, as Tom said, trying to get things done now and building on existing U.S and international global health platforms. Um, but those are the kinds, those are a couple of the uh, thoughts that I come away from in, in, in thinking about this, putting this task force report together during the course of the Ebola crisis. I don't know if Tom, if you have other The only thing I would throw out, I mean, it is, uh, well, first to acknowledge, Anya was the first uh, task force uh, director who started this project. And I also want to acknowledge her successor, Chris Tuttle, because they, they both have did terrific work on this. Um, but uh, the drivers behind uh, the Ebola crisis, what made this uh, different from the tw 25 previous outbreaks of uh, Ebola is uh, it was the first real urban outbreak of this disease. Uh, what I think that highlights is that there's unprecedented rates of urbanization going on in these countries. It isn't in the mega cities that you think. It's by and large cities of a million people or fewer. There's limited public health infrastructure in those settings. And you have, as we discussed before, uh, in many areas, and particularly in West Africa, very rudimentary health systems. Those are the same drivers um, behind uh, a lot of this uh, non-communicable disease issues. And I think it's incumbent on us. Uh, the world's attention is focused on Ebola now. I think the president has asked for something in the area of, uh, somebody mentioned in the back room there, $7 billion at this point. Uh, it's incumbent to spend that money in a way that is more broadly applicable, in my view, than just Ebola. There's, there's lots that needs to be done in these countries. Terrific. Yes, right here. Yes. Oh, no, right behind you there. Yep, thanks. Um, <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Paul Eisenman. I'm a consultant on uh, global health and education programs. Uh, working with the Results for Development Institute. Um, I, coming back to the tobacco issue, which has come up, um, I'd like to congratulate the whole team. I have read that section, and it's really great, and I'd commend it to everyone. And I don't want to put words into your mouths, but given what you've said already about the importance of tobacco control, and given that, tobacco contr that raising tobacco taxes I think is generally agreed to be one of the very most cost-effective things that can be done in all of public health, not just the NCDs, and that it raises money for, for uh, health systems uh, in general. Would you agree that the US government, if there were to be a task force of the sort that you recommended or not, should, in all of its efforts, including its uh, aid, US aid, as well as trade, 
give very, very high priority to getting countries to raise tobacco taxes to save lives and to raise money for other programs. And I mention that because I think where it ranks now, as far as I can make out, on the priority list is uh, you know somewhere way down there when it ought to be way up. Right. So do you Thank agree you. or not? Uh, taxes on tobacco, Governor? Well, I doubled, uh, was party to doubling t tobacco taxes. I think what the gentleman says is true. It's a pretty straightforward economics and works. And you can, and you can put the money, yes, to uh, it's best done, uh, uh, best sold, I think, if, if you plan to devote the money, as uh, we did in our small instance, to uh, important health promotional, uh, in our case, the uh, coverage of uninsured citizens. So yeah, and I think the report is about as explicit as uh, it needs to be uh, in uh, encouraging exactly the direction you're talking about. Yeah, and to provide uh, and to provide uh, advice and assistance from the United States with respect to our experience in that area, technical advice and, uh, uh, and assistance in that area, um, and to, to give them the ability to move in that, give uh, other countries the ability to move in that direction with the benefit of our experience. Terrific. Uh, let's see. Yes. Cameron Massey with the Livestrong Foundation. The report noted the challenges with trying to assess what exactly the U.S. government is spending on NCDs. And I'm just hoping that you can clarify for me whether there is a specific recommendation uh, for an additional investment by the, by the U.S. government. Um, and if so, what, what is that amount? And if not, why did the report fall short of recommending a specific amount? Good question. Thank you. Is there a specific amount? Uh, no. There is in a, a, of a sort. Uh, what we did in the report is um, we do acknowledge, and we did as thorough of a look at that you can in terms of what the U.S. currently spends. When you look at the report, you'll see a, a very detailed cataloging of all the U.S.'s <coughs> programs uh, in this area. Um, so we, we, we tried to uncover as much as we could. What we uncovered from that is uh, $10 million out of a global health budget of more than $8 billion. That's what the uh, report shows. What we indicated in the report is uh, we for each of, the, particularly the shovel-ready recommendations, we make recommendations about, uh, or we show what the cost effectiveness of those uh, recommendations might be, so we do that. Uh, in terms of how much it's gonna actually cost, a lot of that depends on how well it can leverage existing US systems and whether that adds money to try to integrate it in or makes it more affordable. What we did say in the report is, given what we've shown on cost effectiveness, if the US was just to look at uh, some of the air, other areas where the U.S. has global health priorities that are um, priorities, but not something necessarily that we spend a lot of money on, let's say tuberculosis. Uh, tuberculosis in 2013, I think, received $236 million. And what we say in the report is that if you were to spend that much, that would go a long way in implementing a lot of the solutions that we put in the report. It would also be a 23-fold increase than what we spend now. Um, so that's, uh, we do mention the report, but uh, Mitch is quite right. We did not do a detailed cost analysis of what, the, if the U.S. implemented, what it would cost. Yeah, I mean, the way I recall it, we, I mean, we consciously avoided picking some number because you and everyone else would have immediately zoomed in on that and <laughs> overlooked all the more fundamental points we were trying to make. So uh, I, th I, th I think it perfectly suffices to say, once again, that, that, uh, this, this tiny trifle we're spending now cannot be the right answer. Whatever the right answer is, barely a tenth of a percent of two tenths of a percent of the federal budget is uh, not, cannot be uh, correct. Perfect. Um, yes. Yes, that's right. There we go. Thank you very much. My name is Lisa Cardi, and I'm from the Joint United Nations Program on HIV AIDS. And for the past three years, I've been very involved with one of the initiatives you mentioned in the report, which is the Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon Initiative, which works to build off some of the US government's funded platforms to work on HIV AIDS to bring in cervical cancer screening in low-income countries. And 
We've seen many of the things you've described. You know, we, we've seen deficits in human resources, deficits in innovation to sort of get services to people. We've seen some deficits in leadership and commitment in the countries to actually work on these questions. Um, my, my question is, you've mentioned uh, India, you've mentioned China, possibly Brazil, as countries where there could be a different kind of engagement to address some of these problems. And I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about how you would see that engagement unfold, mm -hmm. operationally, strategically. What, what's the entree point, and what do you think the best way to pursue Another it is? excellent question. You want to, um, you want to start Tom, off? Yeah. Sure. I mean, one of the things we mentioned in the report is we conduct um, Tom, being uh, deeply involved in these, in his previous position, we conduct uh, regular uh, dialogues with these countries. It's always, um, I can say this as a, as a former trade official, it's always a challenge to find ones where you're not just there to give them a hard time, that you're doing something positive and cooperatively. This certainly provides uh, a strong opportunity to, to do that. These are shared challenges. And um, in terms of engaging on this, and particularly the areas where we, we haven't necessarily made as much progress as, as we would might, we mentioned the longer term categories uh, in this report about lower cost chronic care or some of these nutritional issues or other issues, those might provide um, good avenues for that. In terms of looking at the shorter term possibilities, we really looked at the possibility of trying to leverage um, existing U.S. global health infrastructure. Again, we did a very detailed analysis. For those of you who haven't seen the interactive online, I can recommend it to you. We did 49 country case studies of what the burden is in each of the countries that receive more than $5 million per year from, from the U.S. Um, we talked about some of the infrastructure, the pilots that have gone on, and the possibility for doing that. We have, were fortunate to have on the task force Eric Goosby, um, who, for those of you who don't know, was until recently um, uh, the, the head of the Office of uh, the Global AIDS Coordinator. And um, he's very passionate on this uh, topic of leveraging that infrastructure. Lisa, I think that um, I think at, at three or four different levels, uh, you need to infuse the development assistance program between the United States and nations uh, with this as a, as a priority or as an, as, a, as an affirmative element. So, for example, you know, we have substantial bilateral assistance efforts in places like Afghanistan and Pakistan and other places in the, uh, in the world, less in Pakistan now. Um, and to, to make this a priority in that, in that assistance mix uh, where we have leverage, frankly, uh, providing, uh, providing assistance to, to, uh, to countries in need. Second uh, would, would be to use U.S. leadership uh, to make it a priority uh, for international organizations, international health organizations, where we are typically a leader and provide typically a lot of the resources. And third, and I think where there's a real opportunity, is in the bilateral strategic dialogues that we have with large nations around the world, like India and China and Brazil, uh, and to bring it formally uh, into those structures um, as, a, uh, as a priority. As Tom said, a priority where, uh, where it's, it's a uh, a win-win and something that can be done uh, jointly and something, by the way, uh, that we, in cooperation with countries like the ones we, we, we're talking about here, uh, could um, work around the world. Because the, the, these countries also, like uh, China in particular, have um, uh, programs that they, work around the, uh, that they work around the world as well. So I think it's kind of it's got several dimensions to it. And it's, I think that the short answer is that to making this an, a, an affirmative element in each of those channels. Let me just follow up a little bit on that. The existing infrastructure, international infrastructure for dealing with health issues, uh, friend or foe in this, and what, what is the role of uh, NGOs, WHO, other international organizations in, uh, in trying to get this coordination going? So in terms of the international institutions, WHO, and to a lesser extent, but a significant extent, the United Nations have spent the last decade trying to generate traction uh, on uh, these issues. So from the intergovernmental institution standpoint, there's, um, there's, there's buy-in. I think the big challenge has been where the uh, resources to, uh, are going to come from um, uh, in, on this issue. And there aren't a lot of foundations that have been uh, in the space. I want to acknowledge one because they also support this task force, which was the, the Bloomberg Foundation. They've done a lot, particularly on um, uh, tobacco. 
the Gates Foundation to a lesser extent, but a significant extent on tobacco and uh, cervical cancer. But there's, there really isn't a lot from that space. And I think one of the things we want to make clear in this report is the same reasons we ultimately invest, m most of what we invested in global health isn't a direct threat to US citizens. Uh, malaria in a low-income country is not going to mean malaria in the US if we didn't invest in it. Uh, most of the things we invest in are not direct threats. We invest in them because they are debilitating to those countries and to their populations. Uh, they're driven by poverty and they're preventable. All the same reasons apply in this instance. Um, one, of the great, uh, uh, one of the great opportunities, though, is that we already have, to some degree, in many of these cases, interventions that can be adapted, hopefully, for fairly cheap. You know, the idea, of course, is of the task force is to, is to make this happen, right? Is to provide a, is to, is to provide a, a kind of a broad-based, um, supported, uh, fact-driven uh, presentation on the challenge. Uh, Matt Smokes, you said at the beginning to, uh, to um, kind of shake the lens here to say, you know, what you might think is the most important health threat isn't. It uh, doesn't mean the other projects are not important that have been very, very successful in a large extent. But there's another challenge here that needs, that needs attention, and that's, the, that's one of the principal purposes of a task force report like this. But the second element of it will be, as you mentioned earlier, will be the United States making a priority for its interactions with these international organizations. Perfect. Right here in the front table. <coughs> well, thank you very much. <coughs> Anselm Hennis, Pan American Health Organization. First of all, let, let me congratulate the task force for this, this monumental piece of work here, which I hope will catalyze the way forward for non-communicable diseases. Now, within the Pan-American Health Organization, we have had a resolution which has been agreed by member states on universal health coverage and universal access, which obviously encompasses non-communicable diseases. My question to you as a committee, how do you see the way forward for the incorporation of um, NCDs under the aegis of um, universal health coverage, universal access, which is, after all, chronic diseases? Mm. Healthcare coverage in uh, developing countries and the best uh, approach, universal or, or otherwise. Yeah, I mean, to some degree, it's a, it's a great question, but to some degree, it's very similar to Patrick's question, which is there's no question in these countries having competent health systems is, is the only way uh, to make long-term uh, progress on, on these issues. Um, we focused in this report on just a non-communicable disease issue and also specifically on what the role of collective action might be, meaning uh, international initiatives uh, ideally led by the US but working with partners as well in fostering that process. Um, so uh, that's, that's where we came up with in the recommendations. I mean, one answer is just an important, huge cosmic question, but way outside the scope of our assignment. But within our report, and it, it just to I state what I guess is obvious anyway, um, a major reason this, this ought to engage all our attention is because it threatens the economic growth of these countries in a very real way. You know, a lot of developed countries, it's been observed, have the, the, the problem with their low birth rates and so forth. They've gotten old before they've gotten wealthy. And uh, these countries are getting sick before they've gotten wealthy. And the incidence, is out, as, as the data keep, kept showing us, is outrunning the, the per capita income, for instance, it increases. And so um, if, it's the noblest aspiration of all, universal access and to affordable health care, but you're never going to have it in any society if you, if you don't have the economic uh, um, uh, you know, wealth and, and in this, these cases, a lot of growth to support it. And so uh, I think the way I look at it, the, the horse here is is to begin getting on top of these problems so these economy, these countries can grow to the level that we all dream that they will reach. Terrific. Uh, yes, in the sweater here. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi. Uh, Nancy Roman, formerly with the United Nations, working on hunger and health, and now with the region's largest hunger organization here. And um, thank, thank you very much for the conversation and the report. Um, one of the things sometimes at the council, I, I struggle with the division between the foreign policy and the domestic policy. The budget's configured that way. But this is one of those times I think a, whole, a co merged conversation would benefit us. 
Um, we're serving 530,000 people here, um, low-income, hungry people. Of those, 49% have heart disease, and 23% <coughs> have diabetes or are living with a diabetic, right here in greater Washington area, never mind the rest of the country. And um, as I've been listening to the conversation and coming from the UN and caring so much about the issues elsewhere, I, two, two questions. One, just your thoughts on dividing the low-income countries, you know, low and emerging countries from the other countries who struggle with, with these diseases as well um, for reasons other than budgetary channels in Congress. Um, and then the second question I had is just how much did you all think about nutrition? Uh, you know, diabetes and heart disease are diet-related diseases, and the biggest thing you can do is eat well and communicate that information, which we're very focused on. Thank you. So um, why divide the low-income uh, countries, middle-income countries from the rest of the world? So most, most oh, really every initiative I can think of on non-communicable diseases has dealt with them globally. Um, the UN's high-level meeting, on non-communicable diseases dealt with all these uh, diseases globally. The reason why we wanted to separate it out in this particular instance is the one I mentioned at the outset, that um, when you look at, certainly at a population level, which doesn't mean there aren't poor people in this country having these issues as well, the drivers between what's driving this rapid increase in low and middle income countries and what's driving the persistence of these problems in high-income countries like the US are different. And if you deal with them in combination, you have a difficulty coming around a set of coherent policies. And I think what you end up with is whole of society's approach. We need to remake everything before we can do anything. And I think non-communicable diseases have been in that box for a long time. Um, so we want it to be really, really uh, uh, focused about it. Um, on nutrition, it played a, uh, as you'll see when you, when you see the report, uh, we, we do talk about nutrition. Uh, it is a big issue in these countries. Um, uh, according to our, our good friends and colleagues at the Institute of Health Metric and Evaluation, the leading health risk in low and middle income countries is diet. The thing about that, though, is it's not salty, fatty foods, it's lack of diet diversity. It's uh, Sorry, lack, of what? lack of diet diversity. Things are disappearing from diets. So more and more people are existing on fewer and fewer things. Uh, the accessibility of whether it be fruits or vegetables or other staples that have healthful impacts have, have really disappeared in these settings. And that's just yet another indication of why dealing with these things globally is, is really hard because the problems are different. Yeah, and we discuss, we've certainly discussed nutrition during the course of this, the, the discussion, and I think I don't have the report in front of me here. I think Dan Dan wrote a, wrote a, a, a additional reviews uh, on that subject, which was terrific. very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. We have time for one uh, quick last uh, question. Uh, the gentleman at the table uh, there. The gentleman at the table is not very specific. There. Yes. Thank you for the report. Um, Paul Holmes, uh, formerly with USAID, now with Development Finance International. I'm wondering if you could just comment on um, a point that I took away from the report that has not been emphasized uh, today, and that is that the work on NCDs is complementary to rather than competitive with existing health priorities. In other words, by investing in NCDs, we're actually accelerating our work um, on, uh, on our existing priorities and, uh, and complementing that, uh, that work. Thank you. Go to the detail, the point we make in the, re the, point we make yeah, in the report. Yeah, I mean, the, the point we make the in the same report. Same population, same kind of <coughs> problem. Excuse me. Same population, same, same, uh, same problems. Uh, that's one of the reasons why, I mean, so much of what we do in global health is supply driven instead of demand driven. I was at a meeting uh, the, uh, a few months ago on the best buys in global health, and somebody had asked the US official, I won't specify the agency or the person, um, about tobacco and some other things. And that person had to say, we're interested in best buys for malaria and HIV. And one of the things we point out in the report is that 
this should be demand driven by what the population in the countries that we're investing in uh, have and the problems that are driving uh, premature uh, mortality and morbidity in, in young people, in young poor people. Um, we didn't see them as competitive. The report doesn't make a recommendation about moving money away from other sources. It's, uh, we, we do talk about shifting to an outcome approach. Um, that said, as, as uh, Mitch recognized before, there's enormous disparities. We're, we're a very long way away from um, making these a priority. Terrific. Thank you very much for excellent questions, and thank the panelists, and uh, thank the council for the report.